I've got two main passions, computers and uh, brains. So for a long time, I spent my time trying to think I was gonna be an AI scientist. I spent a lot of time doing AI research. But for the last 20 years, I've actually been designing technology in a way that's actually better for humans to use it. We've started calling it humane technology, and it's based on a bunch of research I've done on motivational design. But today I'm gonna to talk about one aspect of that, which is motivational DNA. So a lot of the things which I started looking into was games. Uh, anybody who plays computer games today, I mean, there's a lot more people who play games. I mean, everybody from Angry Birds on the phone to, you know, geeks who are playing World of Warcraft. But one of the things about games which is really interesting to me was how engaged people get. I mean, if you think about the idea of manipulating pixels on a computer screen and how engaging that can be, it doesn't sound very exciting, but we can design systems based on a lot of things which we understand about the brain to actually make that a very engaging experience and rewarding experience. So initially, we started looking at games and seeing how we'd actually create motivational systems based on it. You might have heard a lot of things recently about gamification. Gamification is kind of the resurgence or emergence of this idea into the uh, public domain. This idea of using games to create engagement in you know, marketing software, but we've also used it in enterprise software. Games are interesting, but to me, what I really started getting into was understanding human motivation. Human motivation, if you think about all the things which we do, which we don't have to do. You know, everything from cooking, you know, we had somebody talking about uh, making cookies, uh, to knitting circles, to exploring, to walking, hiking, all these different things. These are so many things which we do as humans which really don't seem to be that important, but they are. They're really important to us to the point that a lot of these things are actually more important than the things which we have to do. And as I started thinking about a lot of these activities which are motivational, I realized there's a number of different areas about the brain which come into play. So I started looking into that. There's a lot more information today about human motivation. Um, some recent research about how the d motivational system in our brain actually works is actually similar to something a gentleman talked about this morning, feedback. So if you think about a child in playing one of these games, blindfolded, and they're getting cues, are they getting closer or further away from a goal? They're getting warmer, warmer, cold, warmer, warmer, hot. What that child is actually doing is actually creating sort of a virtual heat map of where they think that reward is. What your brain does, what they've discovered, is actually give you a very similar feedback. Through bursts of dopamine and drops of dopamine, it is kind of talking to you, saying you're getting closer to a motivational goal or getting further away from it. The interesting thing is, how does it know? So most of you have heard of Skinner's experiments with rats, right? You know, the rat presses the lever, gets a food pellet, and gets very addicted to pressing that lever. You know, to the point, you know, when they do a light which flashes before that lever, it pays a lot of attention to that light. But the interesting thing is, if the rat pressed the lever and got a badge, how many times do you think that rat would press that lever? <laughs> Not very often. Food is motivating to that rat. All right, to humans, there's a lot of reasons why badges and social credibility, reputation, things like that, achievement, are important to us. But to a rat, food is important. So if you start thinking about motivation, I mean, a lot of times people have separated out intrinsic or innate motivations and extrinsic motivation, this idea of you have to do something to get something. You know, I have to do really well at a test to get five gold stars. And they kind of been talking a lot recently about this idea that, you know, extrinsic motivations aren't really the best way of actually designing systems. But the way we started looking at it was, what is that actually, that rat doing? And so when you start looking at the evolution of our brain, a really interesting thing occurs is the fact that our motivational system is evolved from our nose brain. And if you think about the scurrying mammals, I always think of it was a scratch from the ice age, kind of wandering around looking for that acorn. You know, foraging was a really important thing for mammals to survive. And what it was doing is when it found a treasure or food in this case, it pays a lot of attention to how it got there. So what happens when you discover a treasure, or in the case of the rat pressing the lever, 
the brain starts paying attention to everything which happened before it. And when it does it again, it pays, you know, it starts getting better at learning the cues which actually lead to that reward. We started calling this, similar to the child with the, you know, the virtual map she's creating, we started calling this sort of pleasure maps or treasure maps. This idea that we're born with some innate motivations, which are like buried treasure, and there's a number of cues. Some of these cues don't make sense anymore because a lot of these cues embedded in our brains are from millions of years ago. It's like some, you know, following an old treasure map and realizing somebody's built a hotel where the treasure should be. A world of glass and brick and electronics and digital doesn't look very similar to the savannas where we evolved. But if you start thinking about how the extrinsic, this idea of learning how cues actually lead to these treasures, our brain's learning constantly. So it takes these innate pleasures, like food for a rat, and it starts paying attention to the cues of how we get there. So it starts mapping or augmenting the maps it's actually born with. As we start thinking about these motivational systems, humans have a vast variety of motivations. You know, there's a number of different people call the different motivations which we have, but we started looking at these as we design technology. What do you have at the top is a number of learning mo motivations, you know, curiosity, mastery, exploration. And you've got a lot of things around social motivations. Why are badges important to us? We'll talk about that in a minute, but this idea of social competition, social cooperation, reputation, trust, empathy, all of these things are very interesting to humans and why badges are actually important to us in some respect. So as we start thinking about all these motivations and what we started calling a compass, you know, what your brain has is a very rudimentary compass at the start and it has these very old maps. And what it's trying to do through your lifetime is actually augment and find new maps of getting to these treasures of things which are motivational to us. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the two fairly unique motivations which humans have, which is you know, social competition and social cooperation. We have to look a little at our you know, close relatives, our cousins, our chimpanzees. So social competition, you know, the chimpanzees are actually far more competitive, hierarchy-based, male-dominated species, which they're very unlike the career builder ads we've seen. They're actually very aggressive, warlike, and territorial. And the interesting thing is we have a lot of social motivations which are similar to that. Status is important to us. Um, you know, how we fit into uh, society, how well we do, fitness indicators, how we actually are very, you know, very interested in showing things which actually make us more, you know, interesting to the opposite sex. These are called fitness indicators. And these fitness indicators are really interesting because to anybody who knows a teenager will know they're very good at picking up what's cool, what's in, what's hot. You know, I'm showing my age here, I don't know what teenagers call it these days, but. <laughs> The idea is they're very good at understanding what is fitness indicators, what's in and what's out. You know, if you think about Facebook, Facebook is what we start calling a statistical or statistical uh, amplifier. It's a great tool for telling people things about yourself, identity, how unique you are, what things are interesting to you. But these are all things which I, we call them socially inward facing motivations because they're all about how you compare to other people. It's sort of a competitive thing. We also have a number of social cooper cooperation motivations. This is actually goes closer to another cousin of ours, the bonobos. Bonobos are, look like chimpanzees, and to the point, a lot of those ads which actually have chimpanzees in it are actually bonobos. Bonobos are very peaceful. It's a female-dominated society, and they use love and sex far more frequently than even humans do. They're very empathetic, and if you think about humans, we actually fit. We actually probably have a common ancestor about six million plus years ago where we actually draw from the, both our cousins. We have competitive and cooperative, empathy, trust, reputation, fairness, all things which are really interesting. So if you think about these two opposing social motivations which we have, along with the foraging, mastery, exploration, we start really understanding a little bit more about a motivational landscape. So as a technologist, we design technology and we try to understand users. So we started doing more than just demographic research, we did psychographic, and now we started looking at things called motiv motivational research, understanding the motivations of what drives people. This is actually a simple grid uh, based on what we call motivational persona grids. 
Uh, we actually do far more complex grids trying to understand the motivational drives of our users, but this one's really interesting. Even at a very simple two-dimensional, two putting the learning motivations at the top, the social motivations at the side, we start actually seeing a lot of behaviors and motivations of users even in this simple grid. So being true to badges, we came up with some badges, you know, exploring, uh, this idea of experts, students, learners, mavens, connectors. We start actually starting to understand a little bit about primary and secondary motivations and how they can drive behavior. So how do we use this? So most of you are familiar with sort of the adoption curve. You know, the marketing idea that as technology is adopted, you know, there's different groups of people who come along. You've got the innovators that start to take on new ideas, they look for new ideas. You've got early adopters who like taking these ideas and sharing with people. They're constantly looking for the new thing. Then you, as you get to the early majority and the late majority, you start opening up to a larger percentage of the population. As we started looking at these adoption curves and understanding the motivational drives, we started understanding some common things about why adopting technology or adopting a new product is hard. If you think about the things which uh, early adopters are really interested in, they like finding new things, they like sharing with other people, they like being experts at certain things, but when it moves to the early majority, you've got a whole range of human motivations coming into play. If you think about something like Foursquare, we looked at Foursquare for a while and understood that Foursquare did really well when it was the early adopters who were playing because a lot of the badges are social, status-driven, they, they gave these people who are very early adopters, pioneers, ability to share things like here's restaurants I've been to, this is the travel I go to, these are new things I found. But as Foursquare moved into the early majority, suddenly you have a whole number of different motivations which the users have to actually take on. Badges aren't as important to every single person because a badge is only important to people who like having to share things about themselves. Status is important. So this is just one example of how we take these motivational persona grids and start understanding how our users actually take on technology. Human motivations and what drives this is really interesting. And we started looking at ways of even how human motivations drive ourselves. So you know, as, a, as somebody who likes you know, learning new things, um, I like achieving things, I like mastering things, but I don't really, it's not about how, earning a status, but I like teaching people. So it becomes a really interesting oxymoron. I'm weird, all right? So it's like I'm not trying to, I don't care if people know more than me, but I like when I learn something, I want to share it with other people. So understanding a little bit more about your own motivations allows you to, you know, how you live your life, how you adopt technology. There was a lady asking me earlier, or talking to us about social media and how it's hard to actually take part in social media. Understanding your motivations and what drives you and what's important to you helps you understand about technology and aspects of your life. Thank you. What is your motivations? <laughs>